this is Richard Clark, and we're doing Hot Science, and our uh, stories that we're going to cover this week. Uh, <coughs> what I have is top news. The headline is, he invented a $2 paper microscope for remote lab work so scientists don't have to haul heavy equipment. And there's more to it than that, of course. The technology story is about VR. And the headline is, each guest experience will be different. It's VR and the future of theme parks. So they want to push the level of the custom experience you have with your VR glasses to a new level to make you come at, come to the park. Since you can see VR in your home now, they have to offer you something special. And then I have another uh, technology story about a team of 3D drones that are drones that can 3D print and they're showing them printing a tower, which is not a trivial thing to print since each layer has to fit correctly on the previous layer or it falls down. And in the environment, uh, a different uh, take on spraying aerosol particles, refreezing the poles this study says is both feasible and cheap. And in science, I have our web photograph for the week. And this is, this is Neptune. And it's Neptune like we've never seen it before. And in biology, uh, a story about one of my favorite subjects, which is microalgae. And this is one of the reasons they are a favorite subject of mine. They promise abundant, healthy food and uh, animal feed in any environment. Microalgae grow in fresh water and in salt water. They grow in far northern places and they grow in desert environments. And then the human story is uh, maybe a story for us. Human composting, California clears the way for a greener burial method. So uh, composting is becoming more popular as a way to dispose of what's left of people like us. And the advantage of composting is not only does it not uh, put as much CO2 in the atmosphere, is your family gets a tub of dirt. That they can use however they want to. I guess there are a lot of rules about what you can do with ashes and what you can't do with ashes, but composting is enough of a new situation that they don't have rules about what to do with uh, the remaining dirt. And then uh, the medical story is about a drug that turns a cancer gene into an eat me flag for the immune system. And so this is a way to teach the immune system uh, how to target a particular kind of cancer that first it marks with uh, some other drug. So on to the story. The uh, first story is about a young scientist who was working in the jungle in Thailand. And 
the problem with being a scientist, a biologist working in the jungle uh, is that they use a microscope for a lot of the work and uh, the microscopes they have are big expensive things that you have to be trained to use and you have to carry around and if they take power you have to take them a power source so uh taking a microscope into the jungle is kind of a problem and so he invented uh this which is a folding paper microscope that has two lenses. Uh, it uh, is has the correct spacing between the two lenses because of the way that it's folded. He's using origami folding principles to position the two lenses. And uh, this is a 150 X microscope. And instead of it costing thousands of dollars, like his field microscope costs, it costs less than $2. And uh, the reason why I put this as a top story is this is an expensive, an inexpensive way to get children involved in uh, science. And though uh, part of their market is field workers. The biggest part of their uh, market is to children in school. And so they sell this scope typically in uh, kits of 20 that are unfolded. So as part of the exercise, you have to fold them up into the thing. And then they have accessories like... Uh, slides and things to fix your sample onto the slides and collection tubes and all of this gear. So they uh, encourage the children to go out into the environment and uh, see what they can see. I have a little video that shows you this. And uh, so this fold scope is what it's called. It has a 140x zoom. And this is enough of a zoom uh, where you can see a malaria parasite inside a cell. So it's really quite a powerful microscope. And it turns out the zoom can be enhanced if you just slide the lens of your smartphone over the lens in the fold scope. You can use the zoom from your camera. And of course, you can take pictures of what you have. They have also a little backlight. So if you have a subject that needs to be illuminated, it can be illuminated. And the inventor said, I want to bring science into everyone's hands to make it more personal. And uh, in the schoolhouse environment, uh, they've already sold more than 1.6 million units. They sell them all over the world, but most sales so far have been in America. And there are serious science scientists who are using it. Uh, there is one uh, scientist in India who has used the full scope last year to isolate a new species of cyanobacteria. And uh, here, let me get, share a movie about the full scope.
And part of why I think this is exciting is, you know, we in this century uh, will be going through the biological revolution. And I think uh, this is an inexpensive and will become a readily available uh, tool that can help get uh, young children involved in biology. So uh, what do you guys think about the full scope? Is that cool or what? I don't know why, but I had uh, missed this in my readings over the past uh, number of years. It was something new to me. It looks pretty exciting. Well, it's the press on this is done within the last couple of weeks, so. Oh, yeah, first I'd heard about it. Yeah, and again, I think it's cool that the guy used origami ideas to uh, handle the spacing between the two lenses. And apparently they can, with that, by moving the little lens, they can zoom in or out with it so you can get different magnifications. And certainly I was kind of a geeky kid, but I can imagine myself out trying to look at things and understand them better. One of the things they do also for schools is besides uh, selling these tools, they offer uh, sample kits of different kind of material where the slides are pre-made. And so it gives uh, the kids a way to be able to look at good samples that are carefully set up and just be amazed with what happens when you look at things at a different scale. Well, and there was a good uh, video on in the article that shows them in a classroom with the kids actually assembling the, uh, the <laughs> yes. microscope. Yes. I'd like to see that too, because my question was, how complicated is it to fold up? And if you can give it to a bunch of eight-year-olds and they can do it. It's amazing. It And there's real reason for optimism that perhaps there's a renewed interest in science among children. Yes, yes. It, it makes science accessible. Right. And, and uh, uh, all these right. kids were asked what they were going to do when they took the thing home. And one girl was going to look at her dog's spit. And, wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> And so the kids are curious, and if they have, if the science is accessible, they'll take advantage of it. Yes, yes, exactly. Maybe we can get you a marketing job with the Polescope people, Andrew. I love the expression on the on the school kids' face when they look in the microscope and say, "Wow, wow, look at this!" Yes, it's pretty exciting. Yes. And uh, I didn't look, but uh, I bet you could find them on Amazon. And what I did see was the price for a kit with an assembled full scope and then with a bunch of accessories is like $10. So uh, it might be that you could get one for yourself or one of your grandkids. You don't have to wait for the school to do it. Anyway, so uh, the next story, the technology story is about VR and how uh, that is going to start impacting the theme parks. You know, the theme parks have had exciting rides for a long time and uh some of the rides like uh the roller coaster with the g's that you pull and things like that you're not going to be able to replace with some kind of vr device but they're trying to figure out how to use them in uh the theme parts and the 
visitors expect more and more at the theme parks. They're expensive places to go to and they have to offer something. And they want to experience technology in a theme park that is different and better than what they can experience at home. And part of the problem is virtual reality has its limits. And uh, part of the limits are that it limits uh, one of the best aspects of going to a theme park, which is sharing the experience with the friends who are there. Because while you're wearing your glasses, uh, what you see is just what is presented by the glasses. And so far, that doesn't include uh, your buddy. But the technology now was just started to be installed in 2018. And in 2019, they were enthusiastic about uh, using it in more places. And then came the COVID epidemic, which was a time of uh, theme parks seeing if they could figure out how to survive not having visitors. And that also gave them a time to think about it. So now they've been thinking about these for four years and uh, they're coming up with new approaches, how to be able to use them. And one of the ways that they're using them is in uh, things like a something that looks like a vehicle that is set up in some kind of environment so it'll roll and rock and shock and give you physical sensations and then they have a visual experience that uh, fits with all the shaking so you have an experience a visual experience and a tactile experience a body experience on the ride uh, and in some of the latest creations, they have the writer put on the headsets long before they get to the ride or the roller coaster itself. And so when they're in line and boarding and getting on it, they're all having this other kind of virtual experience besides the regular standing in line experience. So they're extending the use of VR beyond the ride into getting used, getting to the ride. And what they are anticipating is that there's going to be more and more customization for each person as well. Uh, all the parks will know who you are when you come in and they'll know your age and your name and probably they'll know what you like and dislike so they can transform the park for each guest and give them individual experiences while they're going through the theme park. They're already working with this and they have an alpha test on one of their roller coasters where you can choose your own experience. So one person can have one experience, one visual experience on the roller coaster, and another person can have an entirely different experiment, experience. They're saying the classic experiences are not going anywhere though, because there's still nothing that matches the thrill on riding a new roller coaster and I would say from my own limited experience on roller coaster, watching the person next to you uh, get excited. I was on one when I was about eight and my 12 year old brother at the peak of it stood up and said, stop, I want to get off. It made me so happy to see him afraid. I didn't see the rest of that roller coaster because I was hiding under the seat being thrown back and forth. But anyway, so the regular uh, entertainment things are not going anywhere, but they're finding ways now to use VR and extend the VR experience beyond just uh, what you can do at home. And that means 
giving it tactile experiences and other experiential aspects. And so our amusing our amusement is going to change. And I bet this doesn't mean that uh, theme parks will be cheaper. But they want to give you something special when you go. Cheaper to build. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've never I've never tried VR at home. So is is it better these days than it originally came out? I, I imagine it's pretty real. Oh, it's right. It's, it continues to get better and better resolution and stuff like that. That's all standard kind of improvements as they get used to the technology. Uh, I don't think they have any VR glasses that are particularly comfortable. And so far, uh, what I think uh, that we will need is to be able to take glasses like uh, most of us are wearing and then have little projectors in the glasses that uh, project uh, the image onto the glasses. So then you can see besides what you can see, you can see digitally enhanced content. And I imagine the way things will go, they'll pay for advertising. So when you go buy a pizza hut, you'll start getting pizza ads in your glasses. And pizza smells as well. Oh, that's right. They're working. They're working on smell of vision, and they already have at least an alpha test unit. But I still think, as long as they are working through our sense organs and not connected directly to our sense nervous system. Whatever we're going to have there is still relatively primitive. It's not going to get good until they can plug into your optic nerve directly. Well, maybe that's next. You'll uh, when you sign into the theme park, the first thing they'll do is open up your head and put a chip in it. That's right. Well, one of the old themes in sci-fi were. Uh, the jack addicts that had a jack in the back of their neck that connected to their nervous system and they could just go online real time and some people thought it was better than real life okay so proceeding along next we have a a uh, story about 3D printing drones. And these are drones that were especially designed to be able to deposit a cement-like material with enough precision to build tall structures. And one of the things that they are using with them is using groups of drones to make the job even faster. I have a video that I'll show you. And in the video, it will show that uh, this technique was inspired by nature. And the one of the techniques is having multiple drones working together to build from a single viewpoint. Uh, one of the things I think about this is as I had been thinking about 3D printing, you know, one of the limits of 3D printing is the 3D printer. And the 3D printers that you see are all one form or another of uh, stationary objects with a maneuverable print head attached to it. But uh, I was thinking that that still limits what they can do. And here they've broken through the limits by the use of... Uh, the drones to deposit it. And they say this method, method could be used to construct things like buildings on the Arctic or on Mars, 
or to simply help repair tall buildings that normally the repair wouldn't require expensive video or expensive scaffolding, excuse me. Let me now go to the video. Let me, I'm trying to get this video to collapse. Okay, okay. This is a 3D printer on a drone. In fact, it's the first time 3D printing like this has ever been achieved by a free-flying robot. A group of scientists and engineers were inspired by bees and wasps who work together to deposit material and create large yet intricate structures. They envisioned a future where swarms of drones like these could be used to build houses or emergency shelters in remote areas. But effectively combining 3D printing technology with flying robots was an enormous challenge. One of the biggest problems was accuracy. To ensure a tall structure is stable, each layer needs to overlay precisely onto the one below. So the researchers used scanning drones, which fly in with a camera and scan everything that's been printed so far. This information can then guide the printing drones to exactly the right spot. Getting them to stay in the right spot was also tricky. Drones tend to drift during flight, especially outdoors. So the team created a print head that adjusts its position to compensate for the movement of the drone. This results in millimeter scale precision and intricate filigree-like printing. This drone is printing with an expanding foam, which is less predictable to print with, but very lightweight. In fact, every element on the drone needed to be as light as possible to save energy. The team even created a new cement-like material that could be carried by the drone, printed while soft, and which would then harden. Inspired by the bees and wasps, the researchers also wanted to make sure the drones could work together efficiently. They designed them to be semi-autonomous, able to adapt to changes as they're building. During this test of a scaled-up build, the team virtually tracked the drone's paths to show how a group could efficiently print large structures. The idea of 3D printing a house is one that's already being put into practice with ground-based printers. But the team think that the aerial printers could be useful in less accessible places, like in mountains or disaster zones. Or they could be used for repairing things like facades, pylons or pipelines without the need to build scaffolding. Aerial printing is also scalable. You don't need a printer bigger than the thing you're building when you have a team of smaller flying printers. The hope is that 3D printing could be a more environmentally friendly alternative to traditional construction methods, and printing with drones, inspired by the natural world, could be an important part of making construction greener. So what do you guys think about these 3D printing drones? Are they really are, are they really at the point of building outside buildings, uh, structures of any size? I mean, it looked very experimental at this point. Oh, this is uh, this is a Rev One experiment. Yeah, yeah, small. Uh huh. But uh, you know, I think three D printing without the scaffolding is uh, actually a kind of breakthrough idea. And uh, this changes the limits of 3D printing, I think, in a fairly substantial way. This is still, you know, just the beginning of the work, though. Right. Look at how long it took WASP to be able to do it. Well, and they're using drones for destruction. So using them for construction should be just... Uh bit of a refinement. That's but right. Could, it, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Well, they could also, uh, they don't have to actually extrude the building material. The drone could 
pick up a block or something and dip it in glue and then go mm -hmm. uh, stick it to the structure. But another aspect for 3D drones would be window washing. And you wonder why they're not oh, yes. using it for that already. Yes. Well, I don't know if the patent has been filed on that, Andrew, <laughs> but uh, I sure think you're right. Uh, they talked about using it uh, in areas where otherwise you'd have to use some kind of scaffolding or something like that. And that's kind of like what those guys are outside the window on their ropes. Yeah. And cleaning the solar panel farms. Oh, yes. Right. What a good idea. I was wondering about the battery life. Uh, you know, right now the drones, you know, 15, 20 minutes seems to be kind of what they can do, but how, how can they keep these drones going for, you know, an hour or more? You, you just, probably... like, just like robotic vacuum cleaners that when the battery runs down, they automatically go back to their deck to charge. And if you're using a swarm of them, then uh, while part of the swarm is recharging, the other part of the swarm is just continuing to build. Good points, you guys. But, you know, what you talked about there, Chad, with battery life has to be a kind of issue because the drones are still limited in lift capacity. And there you want to use as much lift capacity you can for the 3D material you're printing with. I see a big future for 3D printable foam that hardens into concrete. Or just even for the mold for the concrete. Uh-huh. I saw Again. one too where they were using a drone to carry a fire hose to high elevations to fight uh, oh, uh, that's skyscraper cool. fires. That's and cool. uh, it didn't have to carry the water. All it did was carry the hose and the weight of the hose and the water contents of the hose. But, right. But, but it but could... The hose under pressure wants to lift. It wants to move under the water <clears throat> pressure. So it's a matter of guiding it rather than lifting it. Yeah. Uh, uh, cool. So maybe they can utilize the reaction of the hose as part of the lift. Uh, uh -huh. It also suggests uh, fighting forest fires. They could use it to uh, put retardant on forest fires and things like that. Right, but it still has to be a small moment, like Chad was saying. Yeah. They have a problem with battery life versus load capacity. But automatically going to their docking station to recharge uh, mitigates some of the issues right. of battery life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and once they make them cheap enough, they can go all go on a one-way trip. They don't have to come back. <laughs> That's uh, right, like the kamikaze drones that the Russians are using yeah. from Iran. Now we just need to have 3D printing drones that can print the next 3D printing drone. Sure. And then it's perfect if they're disposable because we can make a bunch of children before we go out on the run. Okay, so next we have an environmental story. And for the last several years, we've been hearing uh, different stories about the use of reflectance in the atmosphere to uh, reduce the sunlight that hits the surface. Now, most of these have been viewed with caution and skepticism from the scientists. But here, if you look at it, the poles are warming several times faster than the global average. And the problem with this at the poles is that melting ice and collapsing glaciers 
accelerate sea level rise around the planet. But it turns out that this study shows that refreezing the poles by reducing incoming sunlight is both feasible and relatively cheap. Uh, so in this plan, high-flying jets would spray microscopic aerosol part particles into the atmosphere uh, at added latitudes of 60 degrees north and south, roughly where Anchorage is and the southern tip of Patagonia. And uh, if injected at a height of 43,000 feet, above airliner cruising altitudes, these aerosols would slowly drift towards the pole and it slightly shades the surface beneath. And uh, though there is this trepidation about uh, deploying aerosols to cool the whole planet, the risk benefit equation is very different if you're just doing it at the poles. One of the things about doing it at the poles, only 1% of the human population lives uh, at 60 degrees north and south or further. So it's a small part of the population. And the particle injections would be performed seasonally uh, in the long days of the local spring and early summer. And then you could fly the same fleet of jets to the other pole uh, during the off period. So the one fleet of jets could service both poles. Now, existing military air to air refueling tankers are not gonna do the job. They don't have enough payload capacity at this required 43,000 feet. There are new designed high altitude tankers, though, that would be able to do the job fine. And what you need to be able to do this is a fleet of about 125 such tankers, and they could lift and deliver the payload uh, adequately to cool the regions. And the cost would be $11 billion a year. Uh, and this is just a fraction of the cost that we hear about creating net zero emissions. So as uh, environmental uh, fixes go, this is relatively cheap. Uh, it does not fix the problem, though. It just merely treats a symptom of climate change and it's characterized as aspirin, not penicillin. It'll treat the symptom, but it won't cure the problem. Uh, the current study is just uh, a small preliminary step towards uh, any possible uh, use of such a system. This first, you have to understand the costs and benefits and the risk. And this study, though, does provide reason to believe that this might be feasible. And I think you will hear more about it in the days and years to come. Sorry. We found that the sulfur emissions from the Chinese coal-fired electric plants did produce cooling. Right. In the uh, organization sponsored by Bill Gates has proposed, and this is four or five years ago, uh, right. putting sulfur, I don't know what what kind of sulfur in the air to reflect the uh, sun at the poles. It's not yes. a new proposal. Right, but absolutely. Uh, what's new about it is just... Uh, the Bill Gates got so much shit about the idea of spraying it all around the planet. This is a more conservative, appro conservative approach and just sprays it at the poles. And again, this is a place where they can uh, 
forecast a significant benefit from the cooling in terms of uh, the ocean levels. And, you know, so it's a, a retread of an earlier idea and applying it in a more limited way. I really think you need to be careful. I just finished uh, a book, science fiction book, uh, based on this exact thing. And uh, it's really on unintended consequences of, of doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, we have tipping points for points of no return where, where global warming has happened with carbon, carbon dioxide, whatever. Well, there's also tipping points the other way. Right. And uh, you cool it down too much and there's no, re there's no return. And in this uh, book, I read they, uh, they ended up with a, a second ice age, or not a second ice age, but a, another ice age. And uh, the problem is it it happened very very quickly, and the uh, the scientists were to blame, and uh, scientists had to go out in public uh, in disguise because they people would kill them uh -huh. for doing this to them. <laughs> so, so unintended consequences right. is a is a big the, deal. deal. Now the fact that they would have to do it every year means that uh, it could be the unintended consequences are limited because if you start to see any of that stuff happening, you just wouldn't do it next year. I think everybody in the know is going to say, please be careful, please be careful. I would we, say that too. We've screwed up the 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 climate enough uh, by accident let's not do it anymore right so but certainly anyway, it's a it's a it's a neat idea and like you said bill gates had this before i hadn't seen this uh, limited scale application which uh, has has some promise i think uh-huh Again, it seems like a, it's a clever idea. It's going to go through a lot of scrutiny before it would ever be done. And the other thing that makes it hard to imagine it being done is, uh, you know, countries around the world might need to cooperate and figure out how to pay for it. And so far, we're not very good at that. Well, we've invested, is it more than a trillion dollars in our, our Afghanistan venture? That's a thousand billion dollars. Right, right. That covers it for a hundred years. And certainly we did cooperate on the work to uh, stop of a problem with the holes in the ozone layer. And that is evidence that you can cooperate and have uh, international effects that change the weather of the planet. So anyway, it's an interesting idea. And I certainly had not seen it until this article either. So they're still thinking about it. Now, the next story is uh, our Daryl Madison story of the week. And this is better photographs than he can get. Uh, so what we have here is Neptune. And now uh, there are two things about this photograph. This is taken uh, from the web with their infrared camera. So you're not seeing the planet like you ever seen it before and those uh bright spots on the planet themselves are clouds of methane ice and the tiny specks you see are moons going around the planet and uh then the uh are these delicate bands around it uh, that 
are kind of shimmer and uh we've never seen neptune like this before the closest that we came they were theorizing about rooms rings on planets beyond uh saturn but they really didn't see much evidence of them until nasa's voyager mission and in 1979 it showed the rings around jupiter and uh in neptune's rings they showed in 1989 and here that here is that picture you see Neptune is just kind of a blob over there and you see these rings around Neptune from the 1989 photograph. But now we have this view of Neptune and what you see again there, you see the little dots which are moons around Neptune and you see what looks like a star, that bluish jewel and that's Triton. And Triton is covered with frozen nitrogen and is so reflective that uh, in this photo, it looks like a star. And one of the things about Triton is it has a subsurface ocean. And uh, they think that uh, it could be a candidate in the search for microbial alien life. And again, we will see now with what we're seeing from the uh, Webb telescope, uh, they say they've snuck a peek at Mars. I haven't seen those photographs myself, and they will uh, photograph Uranus also, uh, but there's not going to be any web photographs of Venus and Mercury because the web has to be pointed away from the sun. Otherwise, it'll melt. So they have to get some other trick for looking at the inner planets. But uh, there we are. That's the latest from the web. And the web still is not through with its first year of uh, photography. And I think we are still have a lot more to see from our solar system before the year is out. Very true. I mean, uh, with Neptune being 2.7 billion miles away, <laughs> even building an aircraft to fly by it again, you know, it's going to take us, uh, you know, eight years to get there. Right. It took the last one took 12 years to get there. That's right. And then uh, so here we have a telescope now that can show us the rings that we never knew before until right. Voyager got there. With a better photograph than we got from the satellite. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's uh, it's amazing to see some of these photographs. Yes. That's what I thought. That's why as we get uh, these photographs, I'm showing them periodically to you because it's all mind blowing stuff. It's hot science. Yes, yes, yes. OK, any more? You're muted, Norman. You're muted, but I know you're giving us great wisdom. Okay, we're going to, you're still muted, Norman. We see your lips are flapping. Hit the space bar. Remember the space bar? I just got a uh, Zoom video call is what happened. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, excuse me. Excuse me. Anyway, then let us proceed with our stories. The next story, again, is about one of my favorite subjects, which is microalgae. And the reason it's a favorite subject is uh, algae is, is the most efficient thing on the planet in terms of turning CO2 into stuff. And 
uh, it's presently very much underutilized. And so the global food supply faces a number of threats currently, including climate change, wars, pests, and diseases. And the thing about this microalgae, which is too small to be seen by a human eye, uh, microalgae can offer some answers to feeding the world's population. Uh, we also need to feed the world's population while we need to conserve natural resources uh, for generations that may come. And uh, while a solution from microalgae is not really yet in sight, it's certainly not out of reach. And now European scientists are investigating microalgae, also called phytoplankton. Uh, and this is a subgroup of algae consisting of unicellular photosynthetic microorganisms. And microalgae can be found in seawater and in freshwater. And it's been gaining attention in research due to their extraordinary properties. Uh, they can be used for an animal feed. They can be used for in various foods. Presently, they're being used in such things as pasta and vegan sausages and energy bars and bakery products and vegetable creams. And most of the present microalgae cultivation uh, centers uh, they are producing dried biomass such as chlorella or spirulina powder that are foods providing many health benefits. And some microalgae strains produce uh, as much as 65 to 70 percent of protein, so very high protein sources, and they also are a sustainable source of omega-3 fatty acids like we normally get from fish. The uh, son of a friend of mine who is a, a bio guy has a small company whose the sole product they make is omega-3 produced by algae and the purity of the, his uh, product is higher than anything you get from fish and it doesn't have any of the mercury contamination or other things that happens in fish-based sources. So this is already being used and advanced people are figuring out how to be able to do this business. Microalgae also does other, produces other bioactive compounds like B12, vitamin K, vitamin D, and things with health properties. And uh, again, microalgae can be cultivated in different locations and there are different conditions. We can grow it in Iceland. We can grow it in desert climates. Uh, today, microalgae are cultivated in bioreactors, but it's not just a food supplement in Chad for example, which is a landlocked, low-income country, the consumption of spirulina harvested from Lake Chad has significantly improved people's nutritional status because uh, it's an excellent source of proteins and micronutrients. So it's being used directly to uh, help the food and nutrition problem in places in the world already. And then microalgae also offers climate benefits by sequestering carbon dioxide. Uh, right now, though, the microalgae production is not very high. The, in the world, in 2019, it produced less than 60,000 tons in the world. And that compares to 9.4 
billion tons of other food that was produced by the system. So to have much impact on uh, the world's food situation, we need to increase the production rate of uh, microalgae by at least 300,000 times which is a big increase to produce 1% of the world's food. They are trying the issues right now in pr producing this microalgae is uh, there are obstacles and the biggest obstacle is a lack of automated production. Uh, the production of microalgae goes way beyond cultivating the microalgae, uh, you have to be processed, clean, and dried before you can make it into a usable power. Uh, they are, don't have it automated, and uh, many steps still involve manual labor. And so there are significant work that is presently being on going to automate the production. Also, there are regulatory issues like in Europe where this research is going on. There are only seven species that are authorized. So as they continue to develop new microalgae species for uh, human and food use, they're gonna have to get regulators to uh, change the rules and allow them or they're gonna to have to do something to make it easier to use. And so scientists agree that microalgae has the potential to change the way that we eat for the better. And uh, microalgae can help increase the protein production in environmentally positive ways. Also, since you can have your bioreactors in the desert, you can do it without using the kind of land use that you presently have for farms. So there's a lot of potential in microalgae. And also the potentials in algae in general, they found that kelp forests the kelp forests around Australia, for example, uh, are as environmentally productive in terms of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere as is the Brazilian rainforest. And also they're doing lots of work uh, with the nitrogen fixation using microalgae uh, to replace fertilizers in rice paddies and things oh, like yes. that. Yes, yes, yes. So again, there is enormous potential and part of what I think about this potential is this, you know, we have so many natural systems that we really don't know about well enough to figure out how to use them. And that's one of the areas where there is a lot of research going on. Okay, so proceeding along, the next story is about human composting. And let me just bring up a picture. You have seen before and after pictures. This is an after picture. This is uh, was somebody's grandfather, I bet, or grandmother. And uh, then what well, that's a bag of uh, compost like you could go buy at the garden store, except it is somebody's uh, human remains. And so California is the fifth state to legalize this environmentally friendly process. And Cremation now, which accounts for more than half of the burials in the USA, 
is an energy intensive process that emits a lot of CO2 in the air and human composting uh, doesn't use the energy and doesn't generate the same level of CO2 in the air and the body is naturally broken down into soil. The process involves placing the deceased in an eight foot long steel box that is filled with biodegradable materials like wood chips and flowers. And after 30 to 60 days, the body breaks down into soil that can then be returned to its relatives. And the demand for this kind of what they call afterlife care, I hadn't seen that term before for this process, but for afterlife care that is green, uh, the demand is uh, going up. But of course, not everyone is supportive. For example, the California Catholic Conference says the composting process, quote, reduces the human body to simply a disposable commodity. And so they don't like it. And though when they're through with this cremation and the body is composted, it's returned to the family and already customers have planted trees and flowers or spread the soil into the ocean. There is one man who is a farmer who requested that his uh, composted body be returned to the farm where he spent his life tending. Now, composting costs between $5,000 and $7,000 that compares to a little over 7,000 for casket funerals or 6,000 for cremations. So it's price competitive and it wouldn't surprise me to see the price coming down. It's common with new technologies that as you do them for longer, they become cheaper. And so I've always wanted my remains to be used in a rose garden, and now maybe I can do it. Anybody yeah. else want to be dirt? <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely. This uh, cremation, which is the only currently available technique, is terribly energy inefficient. Uh huh. The um, this isn't a lot different than just burying people in mass graves, and why don't we do that? You're absolutely right, Andrew. That's one of the things I was thinking myself. If you just put them in the ground and don't put them in that expensive box, then they'll just compost naturally. Yeah, a lot of the price here is for the ceremony and the segregation. Uh huh. And when people get to the point where they don't need that, then uh, it's going to get less expensive. Uh huh. And certainly, uh, here we here in Chapala, when among our Unitarian friends, when somebody dies, then they have a memorial service for them, and whatever happened to the body is not a doesn't matter. In my family, we've always had a cocktail party. But, right. Uh, that sound. Uh, in, in some religions, I think they bury people in in cloth bags. Right. Rather than in caskets. Yes. Surely. In India, they would bury people if they could not afford the wood for a cremation. If you were really poor and died, you couldn't afford to get cremated. So then they would bury them. And I saw graves uh, literally by the roadside where this had happened. And they use cloth bags or just the uh, body itself? I think they use cloth bags. They, they know they have cloth bags. Maybe they could use an old sorry. It's a shroud. 
Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's, that's what the Muslims do too. It's just uh -huh. a shroud. Anyway, so, plant a tree on top of you. Yes, right. That's what I think is a good plan. And some people are doing it already. So these uh, technical changes even show up in how we die. It affects us everywhere. Now, what did you call this afterlife care? Yes, afterlife care. So anyway, I thought that we could make a business uh, if we can just get cooperative uh, doctors here in the Chapala area, we could make something that I call fly and die because it's cheaper to die in Mexico than it is in the US. And so we could just have them uh, fly grandma down here, put them in one of these nice pleasant places with a view out to the lake and then attend to them inexpensively after that and save thousands of dollars. So there far, could I, be, there could be some regulatory hurdles. I think there could be, but uh, there's money to be made. We just needed an investor. Anyway, the last of the stories today is a cancer story, and it's one of the kinds of cancer stories that we will be seeing now. Uh, and one of the issues with tumor cells is that they are very good at evading the human nervous system, and they put up physical walls and disguise themselves and trick the immune system with molecular tricks. So uh, they're a problem dealing with cancer cells because of that. And researchers now have developed a drug that overcomes some of those problems, making cancer cells uh, marked for destruction by the immune system. And this new therapy then pulls a mutated version of the protein KRAS to the surface of cancer cells where uh, there is a drug complex that then attaches to them and acts as an eat me flag for the immune system. And then a part of this is immunotherapy that makes the immune system, uh, teaches it how to effectively eliminate all cells that bear that flag. And uh, when they are able to put, bring this protein KRAS to the surface and mark it with a, program, a protein, it becomes much easier for the immune system Part of the problem with the immune system is that it typically recognizes foreign cells because of proteins on their surface, but cancer cells have few of these unique proteins found on their outside, they're on the inside. And so uh, proteins that uh, differentiate tumor cells from cancer cells are inside the cells where the immune system can't detect them. So one part of this is it makes this particular KRAS complex move to the outside of the cell where it can be attacked. Now, about a quarter of the cancers uh, in human cells have this KRAS mutation that they are targeting in this therapy. So this therapy is potentially a cure for a quarter of the cancers that exist in people. And 
Uh, they, there are also drugs that attack this. They're figuring out how to use these uh, together. And this new strategy of leveraging the immune system that we can combine with targeted drugs can lead to deeper and longer responses for cancer patients. And uh, part of the research they did, once they had this uh, mutated KRAS identified, is they then looked in their database of billions of human antibodies and found the one that was the most effective. And then that is the basis for the immunotherapy is to make that antibody uh, more active so it can uh, wipe out the cancer. And what they have shown here is the proof of principle that uh, cell resistance to current drugs can be killed by this strategy. More work is needed, but this new approach could pave the way for a whole range of treatments with not only cancers with these mutations, but other pairings of tar targeted drugs with immunotherapy. And uh, the developers of this say that this is a platform technology. That is, this is a new platform that can be used to attack other cancers and other diseases. They're pretty clever, these guys. And that's why we want more kids involved in STEM and uh, biology and are getting them these cheap microscopes to get them excited when they're young. Okay. Then we'll see you next week. Adios. Yep, that's good. Adios.